The rules and the codes have been rewritten behind closed doors such that almost all sex can be charged as something criminal. It reinforces a traditional femininity that sees women as needing protection, sees women's sexuality as um, something that's endangering to them. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason, and today we're talking with Laura Kipnis. She is a professor at Northwestern, does film and journalism, and is the author of the uh, fantastic new book, Unwanted Advances, Sexual Paranoia Comes to Campus. Laura, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Hi. This book, it grows out of your 2015 uh, kind of inquisition for an article you wrote in the Chronicle of Higher Education of all places that some of your students said created a hostile workplace or, or like in, invaded their safe space. The controlling metaphors in your book are McCarthyism, satanic ritual, child abuse, witch trials. Summarize your case and why you're thinking about it in these terms. Okay, just to a slight correction, it wasn't my students who brought okay. me up on charges or marched against the article, it was other students who I'd never met. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, which is to say, it's not all students, and that's right. something that gets, you know, forgotten. It's a cadre of activists. So, um, and they were grad students, right? The, it was two were. grad students who brought me up on Title IX complaints. Mm -hmm. There had been this protest march before that against the first essay, which I think was largely undergrads. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as far as the metaphors, I mean, this is something I've been thinking about and trying to puzzle out because I do think there's this growing climate of sexual paranoia on campus that has fueled these Title IX like inquisitions, partly because, as you know, people probably know, the federal government, the Department of Education, dictates that colleges and universities have to conduct these um, tribunals on campus, but to try to minimize or lower sexual assault and create a, you know, atmosphere on campus of gender equity. Right. So there, you know, are good reasons behind this, and everybody does know that sexual assault has been a problem, and oftentimes an unaddressed problem. So just to say all that, right. but um, and your the, your piece in the the first piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education, it was basically you were reflecting on your experience as an undergrad and a grad student, and kind of a looser sexual morality on yeah. campus between students and professors, or just more broadly. So how could yeah. people, you know, I mean, how could they get upset at that in, in the sense of somehow then you being on their campus was threatening? Yeah, well, part of the problem is I tend toward irony, and you're not supposed to be ironic about these things. So there had been this new regulation prohibiting professors and students from dating. I mean, even if they were in different departments or different schools or on different campuses. So I thought that went too far because, you know, we already had regulations against non-consensual sex, but right. this was prohibiting consensual relationships, which to my mind was addressed at women and at um, impeding women from doing things they might want to do. It was like a protectionist, I mean, I called it feminist paternalism. Mm -hmm. And around the same time, there was this, uh, all this stuff about trigger warnings going on. And so I was writing about this atmosphere of regulation that I thought was really infantilizing students as opposed to promoting their ability to function in the world, you know, after graduation. As, as a feminist, is it, was it infantilizing all students Students, or was it specifically kind of denying sexual agency to female students? Well, they're written in gender neutral language, but yes, of course, they're aimed at women, and it's mostly women who are filing the complaints about this stuff. And to go back to the McCarthyism or the witch hunt kind of metaphors, part of what's happening is that um, while we know that sexual assault is a problem, the definition of sexual assault is being expanded and expanded and expanded behind closed doors so that when I ended up writing about this Title IX case of mine and I got all of this information about other people's cases around the right. country, they were being brought up on charges for things like making what somebody thought was a sexual joke in an off-campus bar or eye contact that somebody thought was like the wrong kind of eye contact. So even like micro behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. jokes are starting to be subject to policing by campus regulators mm -hmm. whose uh, 
budgets increase and whose power increases, the more stuff they find to regulate and adjudicate. A lot of this had to do with a Dear Colleague letter that was put out a few years ago under the Obama administration, the, under Title IX, which guarantees equal access to education, uh, any, any programs that are funded by federal dollars, that said universities have to investigate any claim of sexual harassment mm -hmm. or, or sexual assault and lowered the standard of what counts as guilt. Why was that changed or why was it reinterpreted in that particular way? Yeah, so you're talking about preponderance of evidence, which is a much lower standard. It's like 50-50 plus a feather, right. that's how I've heard yeah. it described, as opposed to say clear and convincing, which is higher. And I, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that's the bar of proof maybe in other kinds of tort cases. I'm not entirely sure. But one of the things that's happening also is that it's up to these individual Title IX investigators who act, as I've learned, in this very capricious manner in terms of deciding what preponderance is. And in fact, I just read an interesting study by a guy at UCLA who has kind of modeled or predicted the false conviction rate under the preponderance standard as upward of 20%. Mm -hmm. So the lower the standard of proof, the higher the false conviction rate, basically. Well, you talk about, um, and, and you, you talk about it in a long chapter, which is fascinating, and then also come back to it in your coda, which is uh, a subtitled Eyewitness to a Witch Trial. It, it's a chapter about how, uh, how a no became, or how a yes became a no years after the fact. And you talk about a Professor Ludlow can you a quick, you know, summarize that case for us, and then let's talk about some of the implications of Yeah. That. I should say I didn't know this professor, and I wrote a couple paragraphs about his case in the original Sexual Paranoia article that I wrote, and that was partly why I got brought up on the Title IX charges, because I had used this phrase dating. I said he had dated a former graduate student uh, because I had read a court filing uh, of his. And he was, I mean, this was known on campus. He had, uh, well, not all of it was known. I mean, I've later mm -hmm. found out a lot after I was asked by him to be his faculty support person in his dismissal hearing. And he ended up giving me all the files in his case. Because strangely, or, or in a quirk, he had not signed a confidentiality agreement and all of that. Well, so he could actually kind of talk more freely. Not so much even a quirk as that student protest uh, meant that the university retracted a, a settlement agreement that was in the works. Mm -hmm. And so he left without any settlement or mm -hmm. confidentiality agreement. But so he had had a consensual three-month relationship with a graduate student in his department, and I know it was consensual because when he turned over all this material, part of what he had was transcripts and records of like 2,000 emails and text messages from this three-month relationship when I read all of it. And it's clear that it was consensual, and it's even clear that she had the upper hand in the relationship, that the accusation was that he had misused his power and you know what that doesn't account for is that there are different kinds of power. There's institutional power, mm -hmm. there's other kinds of power. There's the power uh, of who's more in love with who, who's younger and more attractive. You know, there's all sorts of power at work here. Anyway, so that was part of the case. So, but then he ended up getting in trouble for uh, an incident with an undergraduate student. So he had gone out for an evening drinking and going to galleries with a former student of his who had invited him to go to an art event. And she wasn't his student. And I should say there was no uh, code at the time against professors and students going out. And you know, I do say in my own education, which was in art schools and a different era, you know, professors and students went out drinking and all sorts of things all the time. So that would have been no big deal. But maybe in the last, I don't know, five, eight years, 10 years, it's the atmosphere on campus has changed. And this is part of the paranoia story, where I think professors and male professors are increasingly being seen as predators, really, and as uh, always on the verge of misusing their power for illicit you know, gains, right. particularly of a sexual nature. Women are passive and at the mercy of this you know, crew of predatory professors. So this really infiltrates into how any incident like this is seen, and probably, I think, into the students' own perceptions of what happens to them. So he, Ludlow, and this undergrad went out drinking to various art events and bars. 
she ended up sleeping at his place. They didn't have sex. They were both clothed. They were sleeping on top of the comforter. A few days later, she said she tried to kill herself by jumping into Lake Michigan in February because she was so upset about what she said had happened between them. She said he had groped her. He said he didn't, that she had come onto him. He said, she said he came on her. So it was, you know, it was a he said, she said thing. But it, you know, in campus terms, he was pretty much automatically guilty. And you do an incredible close reading of the um, the administrator who actually was in charge of yeah. adjudicating this, and you say it's. I mean, it's totally whimsical almost, or it's. There's yeah. no way he was going to be found anything other than than responsible. Yeah, and in my view, and I have to emphasize, mm -hmm. this is my opinion. Right. There was a lot of gender bias, and there was very capricious uh, you know, reasoning where in a couple of cases she found in his favor, uh, but in other cases she found against him. And in both cases, the you know, there was no evidence supporting the conclusions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's hard to see how she got there. I think about my own undergraduate. I, I graduated college in 85. I have graduate degrees from the late uh, 90 and 96. There were a lot of lecherous professors who were constantly, uh, you know, asking girls out, et cetera. Is is that a problem? And uh, you know, and and if it is, then how do you regulate it? And or not regulate it, but how do you deal with it? And we're not talking about rapists here. We're not talking yeah. about people, but you know, just kind of lecherous people. Yeah. What is the way to to deal with that if it's an issue? I would say the way is education and frank discussions. I mean, I do think we're doing a terrible job of educating students about these kinds of realities. And yeah, I you know, obviously think nobody in a position of power over a student's career or grading that person should be latching after right. them. You know, I also think that students have to be educated and women students particularly to deal with these kinds of situations because they come up all the time in life. I mean life is full of power and hierarchical you know differences between people and you know you can regulate away and I, I myself think there's probably something about human sexuality that is always going to evade all attempts to regulate it. So I think you have to deal with these situations kind of as they uh, evolve and obviously the problem is not just professors, it's students and students, particularly in situations involving alcohol, which I talk mm -hmm. about a lot. So education is the answer to this. You talk about your feminism in the book and, uh, you know, and also the, it's kind of ironic and we ran an excerpt of the, of the book at Reason.com and you know, it's, it's ironic for you because you're, you're a woman of the left, you're, you're on the left, your political commitments are on the left. And the people who are supporting you tend to be more on the libertarian side of things or the libertarian right. Mm -hmm. How has feminism changed over your professional career where at various points if you go back to um, maybe the late 60s there was a flowering of kind of sexual empowerment of women then there was uh, people like Susan Brown Miller and talking about uh, against rape. Uh, you know where the the idea that all almost all heterosexual intercourse was was a form of rape one way or the other because you couldn't escape patriarchy then it you know it kind of it's wobbled around since then what has changed in feminism and how can it, what 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 is a good feminist response to sexual paranoia that re ultimately treats women as uh, you know without agency or or not fully in control of their sexual desire Jesus, that was a lot yeah. of questions. All right. so. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, I'm finding myself <laughs> yeah. in strange company, you know, and a lot of that's on the civil liberties right. and due process side of things because you've got students who consider themselves to be activists and I suppose would think of themselves as on the left. I right. maybe have some questions about yeah. that who are acting like conservatives are acting um, and you've got conservatives acting like liberals. You've got these students, yeah. you know, being increasingly authoritarian and really willing to, you know, throw out free speech and due process and that kind of stuff. So I'm still trying to figure this out, these sort of anti-democratic tendencies. Well, and definitely anti-free speech. Yes. Right? I, mean, I mean, I would say, free expression. I would go so far as to say anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the feminism of the moment on campus, I mean, I'm also saying this is feminist conservatism. And so I know the right, I, I stunned a right-wing talk show radio host, uh, like in conversation when I said, this is you know, conservatism, this sort of feminist mm -hmm. protectionism. And he couldn't grasp that concept right. because the right has instilled in 
some of their minds that you know this can only be this form of, of leftism. Right. So the um, oh, people you're talking great about in the 80s, I guess, when uh, a bunch of religious fundamentalists yeah. and, and feminists were trying to ban pornography. Certain feminists. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's the yeah. point, is it's certain feminists, you know, mostly aff affiliated with Andrea Dworkin and Catherine mm -hmm. McKinnon, who are the anti-pornography right. feminists, and Brown Miller maybe would be right. sort of more in that camp, who did make alliances with the right, and it was a puritanical and I think mm -hmm. conservative form of feminism. Mm -hmm. So the point to make, you know, if to be a, maybe uh, to say it simply, is you have to say feminisms, plural, right. sure. Uh, so I would call myself, you know, like a leftist, emancipatory, you know, mm -hmm. oriented feminist, psychoanalytic. I would have at certain points called myself a Marxist feminist. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's why to find myself, you know, here in the company of reason or mm -hmm. getting calls from the Cato Institute, you know, is, is surprising to me and I'm trying to figure it out. And I also, you know, what I don't want to participate in with the libertarian slash conservative yep. crowd is the feminist bashing. Because no, yeah. what I want to do is reclaim a kind of feminism or revise and you know keep what's useful or what's um, I think leading us toward uh, you know something more like liberation and autonomy and equality and that kind of stuff. Within a kind of libertarian genealogy of ideas there's a, there's a, a strong feminist uh, component and it's People like Rose Wilder Lane, who was the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder and is widely credited with Laura writing. Ingalls Wilder. Uh, yeah, with writing or, or, or editing. She was a professional writer editing the Little House mm -hmm. books. Uh, Isabel Patterson, who was a uh, well known book reviewer. Obviously, people like Ayn Rand, who is, you know, a, would, would not be feminist, but is individualist. And there's a tradition in the 19th century of kind of individualist, autonomous feminism. And autonomy is certainly a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a big concept for, uh, for libertarians. Do you, is that a way forward for feminism to, if, I mean, if it's focusing on autonomy more than, uh, you know, intersectional elements of where, uh, you know, well, it's actually it's race and class that are more important mm -hmm. uh, or power positions, relatively speaking, because one, and I guess I'll, I'll stop talking here yeah, for a second. Yeah, many no, questions well, piling yeah, up. No, well, <laughs> it's, you know, one of, the, one of the weird things is when feminist scholars, and this happens a lot, and I think it's happening with intersectional feminism, they put the gender aspect last because there's like, oh no, you know what? Actually, race or class is more important. Well, well I don't think class is yeah. even figured in. You know, when the students are talking about intersectional feminism, look, I respect this commitment to racial justice mm -hmm. with student activists, um, but it, you know, it'd be difficult to untangle the genealogy of all of this. I mean, yeah, I do veer toward. Maybe it was reading. I, I was going to say toward. Aut ideas about autonomy. Maybe it was reading Laura Ingalls Wilder as a, as a child who was a big influence on me. But, you know, I maybe would leave behind the Marxist feminist and say something like democratic socialist mm -hmm. feminist with an emphasis on the democratic, which I think maybe pushes me more toward a liberal mm -hmm. kind of view. And I mean, there is a certain kind of overlap with the liberalism of libertarians mm -hmm. on such things as free speech and, and due process, I suppose. So there are these tangled lineages. I mean, I suppose where we depart is more on the economic side, mm -hmm. where I would be somebody favoring uh, more government control and economic justice and redistribution and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's you know where I'm trying to sort through my yeah. alliances with you guys. Right. So um, and in terms of feminism, wait, yeah, did I so, answer it or not? Well, yeah. Where where what what is a positive feminism that you would like to see kind of become dominant on campus? And and you're right. You know, it's not. It, you know, even in the 80s or whatever, it wasn't all feminists were, you know, man haters or they yeah, were all this right. or that. But what is, what's a positive vision of feminism that you would like to see become a resurgent right now? Well, I, you know, I think there isn't a, a model really. I mean, there was, when I was coming up, a kind of left wing or materialist mm -hmm. or Marxist feminism that was very interesting to me that talked about stuff like, um, you know, talk much more about class and and pay for housework and sure. you know things like that. Address the material issues. And, and I would assume also things like you know, can women own property? Can women get well, credit? Well, hopefully, I mean, we settled that one a yeah, while ago. Yeah, no, no. But I'm saying these yeah. these are materialist questions of. Uh, you know, it was stunning that uh, women, single women, couldn't get birth control prescription yeah. uh, pills 
until 1973, and, and abortion obviously also a big issue. In yeah, hu huge, and um, yeah, so I mean, the first wave, uh, you know, settled a lot of that stuff, mm -hmm. did get us the vote, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, you know, which is why I think feminism uh, has been this historically crucial, important, world-changing movement. I mean, you know, just the fact that women own any property or have an economic autonomy, uh, you know, I mean, I think people forget how recently that wasn't the case. So it's why I can't kind of join in in the feminist bashing and why I also don't think equity feminism goes far enough, like just focusing on pay issues, because I think there really are entrenched gender differentials. And partly, I mean, this goes maybe a bit off topic for you, but you know, within the context of heterosexual femininity, I think a lot of women, me included, I know this firsthand, are very just simply um, self-sabotaging. I think femininity in itself has got a lot of pathological elements. And that's kind of where, where the campus stuff to me is veering. It reinforces a traditional femininity that sees women as needing protection, sees women's sexuality as um, something that's endangering to them. I mean, part of the concept that is, uh, I think, prevailing in this on campus is this idea of trauma. And trauma studies has been a huge thing. And this idea, um, I also got in trouble for being a bit uh, not deferential enough to this term survivor. You know, you've got people who have a, you know, kind of an uncomfortable sexual experience on a date calling themselves survivors and pressing complaints. And again, not to mim minimize campus assault, not to right. minimize the kind of crappy stuff that guys do when they're drunk and, you know, have a drunken woman in their, you know, sights. So all of that being said, uh, I also do think, in terms of autonomy, and I talk about this in the book, mm -hmm. women have to take more responsibility for stuff like passing out drunk in places that are dicey. And it doesn't mean you asked to get assaulted, but it means if you're, at, if you're saying a guy is responsible for his behavior when he's drunk, I also think women have to be pragmatically self-protective. When uh, you know Joe Biden recently, uh, just this week, said uh, all drunk sex, all drunk sex is rape. Is that a farcical statement? Well, then basically all sex is rape on campus because I mean there, I think yeah. there's a lot of kids. I had a conversation with Susie Bright, the sex mm -hmm. activist, uh, and she said she talks to kids who've never had sober, sober sex, sex yeah. and encourages it for them. But you know Biden is talking about criminalizing a vast proportion mm -hmm. of the sex on campus. And that, in fact, is what's happened, that the rules and the codes have been rewritten behind closed doors such that almost all sex can be charged as something criminal, and particularly those charges go against men. And I say this as a feminist, that you know, if two people are drunk, they're both responsible for the sex that takes place, not just the guy. And, and I mean, just to underscore, you're not talking about if somebody is passed out, you yeah. know, it's like they, they can't consent. That's right. But we're not talking about that. We're right. talking about people who might be tipsy or have been yeah. flirting or even are in a relationship, but retroactively, things can, the definitions can change. Yeah, that happens. And the problem with the, some of these cases, there is, they're very hard to adjudicate because there's, you know, he said, she said, and yes, I do think a guy who has sex with an unconscious woman is a, you know, yeah. can be brought up on criminal charges of rape, but that shouldn't happen on campus because that is a criminal charge. And do you think that, it, would it be helpful if these um, cases were moved off of the campus and put into the actual criminal justice system, which also has, um, you know, its own problems in dealing with sexual yeah. assault? So, you know, that also is the important thing to say that a lot of what's happening on campus and is an overcorrection to what didn't happen previously in the criminal justice system where sexual assault was trivialized or, you know, you couldn't get a case uh, brought forward by a DA or it took years for it to go forward. So the campus system was meant to address that, but I think it's doing it ineffectually. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about kind of how feminism has changed and where it might go. What in your experience, I mean, as uh, you know, you've been teaching uh, college students for years, what, what happened to students? Because this, on a certain level, and I can see it from my undergraduate years, I can see the trajectory where it ends up here. 
But on things like speech, I don't remember in the, in the, at least in the first half of the 80s, I don't remember a student protest that was insisting on less speech. It was always, you know, pushing back against the stuffed shirts who were trying to shut things down. Um, now that seems to be very different. And then with sexuality, you know, where, where is this coming from? I mean, you have to say on campus, there's like really two very contradictory stories about sex because, you know, you do have this prevailing hookup culture. And I should mm -hmm. say, you know, I teach film, and so my students are oftentimes making films and writing screenplays about their own lives, and we talk about this stuff. And so I do think I find out pretty much what's going on. So mm -hmm. there's that side, the hookup culture, and then there's this other side, which is the Although trauma let's, let's stuff. Let's be the hookup culture, you know, as I think we're both baby boomers, and, you know, people were having more sex yeah. as baby boomers. Yeah. Millennials yeah. have yeah. less sex than Gen Xers who have less sex than baby boomers. <laughs> and the greatest generation never had sex, but that's their problem. They're Wait, so you're anyway. saying they're having less sex yeah, now? Yeah, on campus. I mean, most yeah. surveys show that sexual activity both at the high school level and at the college level is actually lower. So, mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, and is it, you know, where, I guess that would be a different question, but where does that come from? But you have a sense of what's going on. I think I have yeah. some sense yeah. of what's going on and you know people are never great self-reporters right. about yeah. their own sex lives but you know I hear how they talk about mm -hmm. sex let's say and it's it's all very open pro-sex there's mm -hmm. a lot of you know discussion about alternative practices right. and stuff you know they're very knowledgeable about about all of this stuff but I do think there is a kind of puritanism as well and this sense of potential trauma harm I don't know where it comes from. You know, I'm somebody who doesn't like to recycle used up cliches. And so all of this stuff about helicopter parenting and coddled students, I don't know. I can't, you know, I don't want to recycle that stuff. Right. But yes, there definitely is a change. I mean, there's a huge change from our generation to this generation of students. And I think in a certain way, it actually, has maybe something to do with the being best friends with your parents and never having gone through this real rebellion against authority. And so they're sort of, you know, calling their parents, every, you know, two or three times a day and never really left home. And not even shouting at them. Yes. They're, telling them, they're yeah. calling them to say, I hate you. No, no they're, they're best, best, best well, you, besties. You do, uh, you know, you uh, uh, use Freudian analysis. What is, what's going on there then? Because this is like a radical shift from what 50 or 100 years ago would have been taken as a universal thing that you individuate yourself against your parents and that you struggle to be independent from them. And we seem to be witnessing, and I, you know, I say this as a parent, uh, you know, a, a much more kind of fraternal bond with your children rather than almost an adversarial one. Yeah. Well, here's something I've been speculating about and don't have an answer to, but maybe you do. I mean, when I was coming of age, there was not the same panic about intergenerational sex. So the professor-student question was, you know, a lot of women I knew, some men, uh, you know, had relationships with professors. One of my best friends married his French professor. He was like a sophomore, so you know he 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 does scored. He, did he stop? Does he speak French? Very well. Uh, yes. well that's good. Yeah. Um, so you know this this panic on campus about the professor student thing. I mean, I think it's almost related to this question of the best friends, and you know, there's something going on about generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm not a smart enough Freudian to answer it, but I do see somehow this stuff is related to itself or each other, however you would put that. Uh, I don't have the answer yet. I'll get back to you on that. What, well, uh, the trauma, uh, you know, kind of the trauma and the, and, and again, without the, uh, demeaning people who went through horrible experiences, but the kind of um, fetishization of survivorship. Where, where do you think that's coming from? Because I can remember, uh, uh, I guess it was Christopher Lash's uh, The Minimal Self, which is, you know, it's a Frankfurt School influenced thesis about kind of Marxist uh, Freudian theory about, uh, you know, and he was writing in like 1980, I think, for that, about fetishizing survivorship and that people were appropriating, uh, you know, uh, stories about concentration camps. Uh, he, he lit into Betty Friedan for, uh, calling, uh, saying that being a suburban housewife in the late 50s was the equivalent of being in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. um, and that that has proceeded apace. Is, 
you know, is that where the, the kind of trauma culture is coming from? Or, or is it that we are so worried that our children are, you know, there are effectively no real threats to kids anymore in terms of, you know, they don't starve, they don't have childhood diseases, very few get abducted, they go to school longer, um, mm -hmm. you know, but we're acting as if, you know, if they see one image, uh, you know, they're going to be ruined for life. Um, yeah. Is this, you know, where, where does this come from? I mean, I think a lot of it would have to do with identity politics. And, you know, I'm not somebody who's going to rant about identity politics because it's often, it's been very important. And mm -hmm. my students have been, I notice, I mean, really schooled in a kind of multicultural curriculum. They're very attentive to all forms of injustice, to marginalization. They're, you know, really, I think, deeply committed and, you know, in an honest way to, to including this range of experiences that have been marginalized into the mainstream, you know, and, and they're great about that. And, and, and you know, very self-aware of their own participations in, you know, forms of privilege and hierarchy and that kind of thing. So another side of that, though, is that, um, you know, the, the traumatic experience or the person who's, uh, you know, on the margin, I mean, that, per, that position is sort of the privileged one in campus politics at the moment. And I suppose some people might blame that on leftists uh, and leftist professors and that kind of thing, um, perhaps. But, you know, I think these, these things are related, yeah. Well, that's, and Dave Chappelle, the uh, comedian, calls this the misery Olympics, which mm -hmm. might be yeah. overly archer. He's in a position where he can say that. I'm not sure that I would. Mm -hmm. um, what has been the reaction among your colleagues and among your students? Because you said it wasn't your students who, you know, protested you. But, you know, what, what kind of response have you gotten as you explore this material? And it's funny, you know, when you talk about irony, and the book is very... Um, I, I, I don't want to say it's funny, it's not laugh at love, but it's very ironic, it's very wry, and clearly humor has, you know, on campus it's hard to be funny these days, and there's Chappelle is one, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, Bill Maher, a number of comedians have said they don't even play colleges anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how have your colleagues and how have your immediate students kind of responded to your material? I should say a little bit about how I'm an anomalous kind of person, um, which is helpful, and probably how I got myself into this situation. You know, I didn't go to university. I went to art schools. I started out as a painter and then a video artist, and I ended up teaching in a university teaching film because I was a filmmaker, but I don't do that anymore. I actually write these books. So um, I've always had a bit one foot on one foot off of campus. So it does allow me to be both an insider. You know, I think this book could only have been written by an insider and the criticisms I've made, but you know, also a bit of an, of an outsider too. And yeah, I think more ironic about a lot of the stuff. So it's been interesting to have this as my material and it's almost like the academic novel or satire that I, I've always wanted to, to write but didn't. So on my campus, I think um, people are sort of terrified, actually, and don't say anything. So after I got marched on and I wrote about the Title IX mm -hmm. thing, my students didn't say a word. I mean, they were kind of great about it. And I one time said to some students I was close to, how come nobody ever brought up this protest march thing? She said, oh, we knew about it, Laura. You know, um, and I have very few colleagues at Northwestern uh, weigh in to me uh, in the, over, about the articles that I wrote and exposing the Title IX stuff, much more response from people around the country. So I don't know if it's that it's the Midwest and everybody's very polite. Um, I can't really answer. So, you know, you, you talk about paranoia, McCarthyism, the Salem witch trials. You know, the Salem witch trials was a classic case of hysteria. Samuel Sewell, one of the uh, judges, ended his life wearing sackcloth and ashes to pay penance for what he did. Um, is this bubble going to burst or, I mean, do you see any sign of that, um, that people are kind of regaining a more, um, a more measured sense of, of where we should be on campus? Well, the interesting parallel is that you've got these accusations made by teenage girls or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. in uh, Salem and sim similarly uh, oftentimes here. Um, I, you know, I don't want to be grandiose. I hope yeah. this book makes some difference. Partly I hope that it means that people who have been through these kinds of uh, inquisitions or processes 
are willing to come forward and talk about their stories. You know, what, what really is happening is a lot of this is ending up in the civil courts where undergrad men who've been accused of things that they say they didn't do or the cir circumstances were more murky, these cases are ending up in courts and it's going to be civil judges that I think turn back the tide of these over prosecutions. And in fact, there's a really interesting case at Brandeis with two men students where the, um, after a breakup, one guy said that the other guy had kissed him while he was asleep and that was sexual assault because he couldn't consent. And this judge who wrote a really kind of eloquent decision more or less said, are you kidding me? You know, because the, sorry, the, what they called the special examiner at Brandeis, that was their mm -hmm. term or some, I think that was the, what they called him or her, uh, uh, had ruled that this was indeed assault because the guy was asleep and couldn't give consent. So the judge's very eloquent decision, I think, will have some effect in other cases like that. Uh, so I think that's what, where it's going to end up. And of course, your book, I mean, and your experience in speaking about it, particularly because you're on the left and a feminist, that is, is kind of a shot across the bow, right, of saying, you know, it, you're not, um, you know, you're, you're not Rush Limbaugh, you know, decrying this or denouncing this. Yeah, and I was in a position that I could come forward because I'm tenured. Mm -hmm. I'm at a research university that does support academic freedom, despite what happened to me. I mean, that's a, a complicated sort of issue in terms of who greenlit those charges, I think. But I think the problem is that, you know, like about half the professoriate now is uh, not tenure mm -hmm. track. They're right. on contracts. Those people wouldn't have a chance in hell of coming forward, writing an article as I did. In fact, if you get brought up on some kind of even specious complaint, you're likely to lose your job. I mean, I've seen that happen and know a couple of lawsuits that are going forward. So, um, you know, and partly because I suppose the kinds of stuff I've written about, I've written about scandal, I've written about sexual politics, I was, I guess, a bit more willing to kind of go out on some, some limbs about it than other people would have. Well, I'm glad that you did. The book is Unwanted Advances, Sexual Paranoia Comes to Campus. The author is Laura Kipnis. Thanks so much for thank talking you. to us. Thanks. It's a richly reported and, you know, fascinating read. So thank you very much. For thanks. This. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.